Tony's an amazing, amazing person, an amazing teacher, an amazing friend. Uh, he's currently the chair of the MFA programs at the San Francisco Art Institute. And since the 70s, Tony has worked in performance, sculpture, and installation. Um, his work uh, deals with the body, pop culture, ID, urban identity, urban relations, um, politics, and media, and has been shown in consequential exhibitions around the world and around the country. Um, I consider Tony to be a very brave artist, and he's a very flexible artist. He's worked in any media you could imagine, and he always pushes things to the limit, and I really appreciate that about his practice. So please um, help me welcome Tony Labat. Thank you very much. Oh, I just sounded like Andy Kaufman there. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're gonna start with a little video and then I can tell you about it. Pero no aquí. Aquí en Jayalía, una vez, en un día vivimos en un apartamento, lo más bonito, me visitaron ellos dos y la niña. Tony Fernández. Yo yeah, recuerdo el triste de pasado a leer. Este es Mario. Era mi casa de mamá. Ahí en Tacoma, en Washington. Tacoma. Sí, es que estaba un fuerte ahí que fue a pasar el arma ahí. En el 72, imagínate. ¿Mm? Visité a Fena en cuando el servicio militar me puso aquí. En el Caribe la vela. Ya. Aquí, no sé, estamos abri abriendo los paqueticos, no sé si en Navidad o qué sé yo. Okay, um, that was my mother, and she's about to be 90. And it's a really uh, very big project that I've wor been working on for the last three years. And um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to get into that project because it would take too long. But all I want to say about that is that I, I um, promised Liz and all the students that I would address a little bit um, my relationship to, uh, I, don't, I don't like to use the word photography, but they are photographs. And uh, in that, um, project, uh, that moment there, I uh, really surprised the, uh, me and the videographer that I brought with me to shoot it. I had no idea what she was doing and I would kind of like asked her like, what are you doing? And she went tr loosely translated, I want to have the pleasure of getting rid of my own memories. And I thought that was, wow. So anyways, uh, on that note, I think my work, as Liz mentioned, um, it's like those connected dots, things, games, and you don't know what the image is gonna be at the end after you connect the dots. It may be a duck or a sailboat or something. I'm still, I use these talks as a way to, I'm still connecting those dots. <laughs> and, and I haven't really seen what, what, it, what that image may be, but um, it's, I think, uh, it will, might never end. So I'm gonna start with, uh, this is me. Um, before the revolution, 
And I want you to notice that I, I am right-handed and I haven't figured out why I have the gun in the left. This is uh, what my father did. If you don't, did not too many people know this uh, game or sport or uh, it, it, there's a debate on that, but it's Hayalai. And he was a very internationally known Hayalai player. And in terms of connecting the dots, this is where my father worked. And I think it, it may start connecting certain the dots in, in terms of my certain interests that I look back on uh, <clears throat> ideas of a stage. Uh, and then the revolution came. And this is a moment in the <clears throat> when Fidel arrived in Havana. This is his first speech. So maybe like about a million people out there. And these doves uh, came and landed on him. And this, uh, this, very, this is kind of like I, I think uh, in retrospect, growing up with these very powerful images that, uh, that also became an interest of people sometimes have asked me, you know, like those doves had to be trained. Like that had to be some sort of theater and all totally calculated. And later on, you'll see an image of like Yves Klein jumping out the window and uh, did he do it or not? And I, I think from my position, uh, I don't really care, you know. I mean, the, the image and that moment was so very powerful. Uh, and many, many other things that were very performative and very how uh, the participants in the revolution really understood the kind of like theatricality, if you will, and how they use the long hair, the fatigues, everything. And so that's me after the revolution. Now, finally, the gun is on the right side. And uh, that was, uh, I think, I, I remember this was just a real uh, bush across the street from where I lived. But uh, I was really interested how I think, I think, I mean, <laughs> that I was trying to like, create this jungle backdrop uh, to create this sort of image. I think also from the howdy duty, uh, it just got really cocky here with my hands on my belt. And, and also, I, my mother made this outfit for me. And um, that continued for a long time I'm, because it was really hard to get, you know, like sort of like cool fashions during the revolution. So I would look at a Beatles album cover or something later on, and I would, my mother would find fabric and make clothes for me because she was, uh, she knew how to sew. Uh, this is when I arrived in the United States, my political refugee immigration picture. And this is when we arrived in Miami, and this is where my mother worked. Uh, she worked in a sweatshop for over 30 years, and it was owned by Cubans, and it was a real exploitation of Cubans over Cubans. And of course, I was all caught up. I got here in 1966 with, uh, I think, the baggage that we all have, and I brought from my foundation years in the revolution. Um, at the same time, I arrived at a time when the, you know, the hippies counterculture. So I think the hippies were my true exile not the kind of exile community of the Miami Cubans, because um, I found them really not only not, well, they, they sort of like it was this frozen, frozen in time, and all you heard all the time was, next year we'll be back, next year we'll be back, and years just kept going by, you know? And so anyways, um, I had a real hard time with uh, sweatshops, and I remember really a lot of times bursting into it and getting into fights with the, the, the owner and, and my mother, please don't do that anymore. And yeah. So then I went to uh, a community college and um, I, I, I think I brought, I didn't know what I was doing. I know that I gravitated towards art. And uh, I took painting classes and I realized that, well, I realized, no, I was, I was told by the teacher every time we had a critique, you know, that I think I, I was pretty good, you know, I was okay. 
and in the critiques I was constantly like, you know, Tony is, uh, you know, doing the lines right or something, and and that that kind of system sort of started bothering me. It was very romantic and very powerful, but it really bothered me. So I, I, then I took a sculpture class, and the same thing happened. People were carving, welding, working, and it, there was something that just didn't feel right, and I didn't know anything about post-studio yet or anything like that. So I just really took uh, the classmates out to make this line and took a picture. And that was my sculpture. And I started like, like I was talking to um, recently having a little conversation with the head of the sculpture department. And we all, we've always had for many, many years this kind of like thing about you have to make things with your hand and that's how you understand the world and, and me coming from the other end. And I said sometimes sculptures is in my head, you know. I don't have to make them. I see sculpture is in my head, like here. And that was my beginning in Miami-Dade, and then Miami-Dade Junior College. And then in the same sculpture class, this was about 1974, I brought my dog shit into the, for a critique. In this, there was this window, this play window in the college, and I wanted to use it, so also, again, very intuitively, I gravitated, I think, to like a kind of site-specific I liked that window and I wanted to do something with it. And I put this uh, baggies containing my, the shit with, from my dog in it. And of course, it started to smell, I got in trouble. And what was really interesting is that I was, I was lucky to have a great teacher, Robert Teeley. And he, I thought I was, go, I was provoking. And in a way, even, I'm gonna piss them off. And yet, he invested so much in this piece that that's when things really, changed for me and clicked like, wow. And I trusted him and uh, here's the detail. And he told me to, uh, that the best thing for me was to get out of there. And he had just met Howard Freed in the Whitney Biennial at the time. And Howard Freed is this amazing artist that I had uh, you know, the luck again to be in the right time at the right place. And Robert Tilly said, you should check out the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, Howard is trying to attempt to develop a program with video and performance and all the things that were happening at the time. So I went to the San Francisco Art Institute and the first piece that I did when I arrived was I um, sneaked out, I stole, I was working in the gallery of the school and I stole their mailing list back in the days when we had mailing list. And uh, I made this postcard and I sent it out to the community, the mailing list, uh, and that's Farrah Fawcett. And in the back, uh, I think it had my name on it. And then I started uh, locking myself uh, at the school in this uh, uh, Studio 9. And I, st uh, and I just, uh, it was amazing. And I tried to uh, many times communicate with my students what it was like uh, when I saw myself inside that TV. And it was my image live, you know, right there. And it was very powerful and uh, very empowering as well. And so I started really, uh, one thing that Howard told me was, uh, speak about what you know. And uh, I took that at heart. And so I brought all my, uh, it was the first time that I think I had a distance to look back at Miami, at the whole trajectory and it started in a way, you know, vomiting all this out. And here I'm doing, uh, so I locked myself and I would do these videos all night long, not really thinking too much about them, just trying everything out. I think in this particular video, uh, uh, the, the TV is speaking in Spanish and me holding the TV is translating in English what I'm speaking in Spanish. So they were very, um, yeah, just really uh, searching. <laughs> uh, then I started moving into uh, installation work and uh, this was a piece uh, that I did in alternative space and you don't see it there, maybe you do a little bit, but there's these wires about ankle height and as the viewer would 
I, I would go to the light, they would trip. Uh, then in 1978, uh, I'm going to go a little fast over some of these pieces because I have a lot. We have not too much time, and and so. But if you have any questions about them, just go ahead. In 1978, what I was hoping to do is because you know it's 40 years of work. It's just pick on some snapshots that maybe um, can can take me and you through some of the movements and shifts and different ways that I work. Uh, this is 1978, and there were two people, two artists running for political office and I think again this is the days of guerrilla now we call it intervention uh, infiltrating into certain contexts and these two artists uh, Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys was running for mayor of San Francisco At the same time Lowell Darling was running for governor of California and where I really uh, uh, could relate to what Jello was doing uh, because he really took it in a very serious way and was really talking about the politics that needed to be talked about. Uh, Lowell Darling was more of a, a prankster and theater and things were kind of uh, jokey. Uh, so I wanted to kidnap him or at least attempt to kidnap him. And this is the attempt at me at trying to kidnap Lowell Darling. Uh, the piece failed. I being a rookie terrorist, <laughs> I, I had a two-door car. And uh, here I am in the process of like, you know, getting the front seat down so we can push him into the back seat. And at the time, people started coming out of the building and we had to go away. But just like with a couple of other projects that I'm going to show, did you take him or you didn't take him? Did he succeed or fail were things that um, I don't think were my priority. My priority, believe it or not, was to get that image. And then the image got published anonymously because I didn't want the piece to be perceived as me jumping on his bandwagon for publicity. I was still an under undergraduate uh, student. And uh, so then that piece, it took me two years before I finally revealed that it was me that attempted to kidnap Lowell Darling. Then, on that sano sort of same track that I was going, the gong show. I don't know if I'm dating myself, if you don't know what the gong show was, but the gong show was a talent show on NBC uh, by a genius man called Chuck Barris. And uh, the stuff that we were doing in Studio 9, I was, I was in school with Karen Finley, Bruce Pollack, and uh, the stuff that we were doing, and we would be watching the gong show, and we started seeing this kind of similarity because we were really questioning the idea of talent rather than the idea of ideas, in particularly in performance art. And so we thought this was a, a great stage and a great place to infiltrate and interested in doing something that was not announced as art. We would just be there uh, within the, the context of what the gong show was. Um, and so we did, and we went intentionally to get gonged, and we did, and there's Chuck Barris, who was at this time telling us that we shouldn't have gotten so political. Uh, at the same time, you know, the very infamous Mabuhe punk club was down the street from the San Francisco Art Institute, and uh, I think my generation was getting a little disillusioned with the first generation that had influenced us and the performance happening in alternative spaces. So um, we really wanted to go into the clubs and infiltrate that. So this is a, a collective that I had uh, with Bruce Pollack and we called ourselves the assholes. And, uh, and there you see the kind of audience we attracted. And uh, our performances pretty much, uh, Bruce would build these props that would uh, fall apart in the process of the performances, and then the piece would be over. Then another sort of band that I had, getting closer to a band, was the Puds, and that was Philip Heiser's signature um, thing, the, his penis through the 45. And again, it was a very aggressive, confrontational kind of act, if you want to call it that. I think. Uh, it was really the energy that was happening between the stage and the, 
and the audience was something that really attracted us as a kind of contemporary ritual. Uh, this is a performance in 1980, uh, <clears throat> very long and complicated. It involved a lot of uh, stages. Uh, but uh, here I am standing with black paint on a mattress that is on top of a boat that is on top of rockers. And it was around the time of the Marielle boat lift and the boat people coming from Havana. I'm sure you've seen the movie Scarface. So that's quite well documented there. And uh, that wave was mostly young black Cubans. And um, I think it exposed the, the kind of racism that still existed but unspoken about in the Miami exile community. So hence the black paint and, and all of that. I am my, I'm having a conversation with my mother, which is amplified. And addressing that, she's given me a recipe about how to make black beans and rice, which in Cuba is called Moors and Christians, and interested in a kind of hybridity with the black and the white. Um, I'm translating the black beans and rice recipe to my American audience while I have a disco ball hanging from my testicles. Yes, it hurt. Uh, after that, I... Um, yeah, I was then, uh, to make it short, I turned my uh, studio into a functional gym, boxing gym, and I uh, started training in order to bypass amateur and get a professional license as a boxer. I had to go in front of the California Athletic Commission and prove that I could protect myself, that I knew how to fight. It took me about six months to get there. Uh, finally, I convinced them, and they gave me my license, and I, the whole, <clears throat> it's a combination of the kind of social sculpture <laughs> that was happening in my gym, which was my studio, so instead of my studio, it had become a functional gym in which even uh, women started coming to, uh, to train because at the time, the gyms in San Francisco did not allow women to train in their gyms. So it, they came and they trained in my gym, and it was that's the, the the part that I missed the most about this project was that year that my studio fun functioned as a gym. You know, the social that was happening every day and the conversations is the part that was like a drug. I just I, it took me a while to to uh, to get, you know to get back to normal. <laughs> Uh, this is a, uh, and the project was just to do one night, one fight. It was uh, sanctioned by the state of California. There were eight, eight fights in the card, and I was not announced like as an artist doing an art piece. I was just one of the boxers, one of the fights in it. Uh, like with a kidnap attempt, people ask me, did you win? And again, it doesn't matter. Or the gong show, did you get gonged? It doesn't matter. We we're on TV. <laughs> um, so these are some shots of the fight. Uh, I invited a punk band to do the national anthem, the units, and uh, we had Carol Dora, the stripper, be the, card, the rope card girl. And it was the beginning of my interest in that kind of, uh, you know, like the, 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 the regular boxing fans, you know, you could tell looking around like, this is not a usual night, you know, there were a bunch of punks, there were a bunch of art world types, there were rich people, you know, um, one of, we, I got in there, two female boxers to fight that evening, and they brought, one of them was Puerto Rican and brought a salsa band, so the whole evening was not the usual boxing night, and this kind of mixing of different, <clears throat> of the audiences <clears throat> was many ways what this project was about, and it was also, for about six months, the media was in my studio almost weekly. It just seemed like I, it, it was covered by the sports uh, section, and what they, want, what they wanted to know is if I could throw a jab. And then the art critic started comparing it to Pollock and the drip and the canvas and performance art and all of that. And then the human interest section wanted to know why this 30-year-old artist wanted to box. And all of that started coming out in the media. And uh, the, the, for me, the piece, that's where the piece happened. It happened in, in the newspapers and the media and the television coverage that it got.
And something that has followed me a little bit during my career has been that question, but is it art? After that, I was a, a little empty and I was invited to go to LA to do a performance and uh, I thought I would do the opposite, you know, rather than being this evil carnival of the art world. Like, what would I do next? Wrestle an alligator or something? So it was the opposite, and this was a piece that for, uh, for eight hours, I was on the roof of Lace, the gallery in LA, and there was this uh, fountain, very minimal sculpture in the gallery, where I would come down every once in a while and go back up on the roof and continue to sunburn, you know. It's a very LA piece and also a kind of, it was nice to do nothing. Uh, this Then around 1980, uh, I was doing this uh, performance, it's called Cry Baby. And uh, d there's this device where I rub lots of onions into my eyes and it makes my body very spastic and uh, start crying. It goes from funny to pathetic uh, to very strange, and I started lamenting the end of the 70s and what the 80s was bringing about and all of that. Uh, then, in, then it moved my work in the 80s into really large video installations, I guess one would say institutional critiques, and working a lot with uh, closed circuit system cameras. I never liked using the word surveillance too much, for me, these pieces were more of a kind of cubistic treatment of space. And in a way, uh, as much as they were very formal, they had a lot of sort of content in them. This is a piece in Austria where I, inside that box is this. And I worked with an electrical engineer to have this laboratory mice. Every time they got on the wheel, it produced enough energy to run a, <clears throat> a surveillance camera a light bulb on the monitor that was outside. Uh, this is a piece uh, that it, it involves two chambers, and in the back chamber there are 150 finches, and with a surveillance camera that you see in the monitor that sits on, sits on top of a pile of broken reliefs of the Last Supper, and there's the back chamber. And the line that you see on the floor is uh, the shit from the birds that start accumulating. So I think in this piece, uh, what I loved was at the end of the month of the exhibition, uh, the piece was ready to go. I mean, it was decaying, it was smelling. It had a life of its own, and I really love that about this work. This was at MOCA in LA. And basically what I did there, I still, today they would probably would never let me, is every monitor that you see there is the, the surveillance system of the museum itself. So I kind of turned it inside out. So in a way, if you wanted to break into the museum, you would just have to look at my piece. And inside that crate is a, a architectural model of the museum itself. And then I also used the theater in, in the museum. And I removed some of the seats with a two-way mirror. And I put up my own surveillance camera, which is what you see the projection on the stage a projection camera watching the security guard that was watching the monitors. So he was always, so there was this whole system going on and in that two-way mirror there was a camera behind it and those empty seats, if you happen to sit in them, would be projected upstairs in the museum in the main gallery. Uh, this piece is called David and Goliath and after that I wasn't quite resolved with the work and then MoMA in San Francisco asked me, they wanted me to do David and Goliath. And that sort of began this dialogue with like, well, that piece was so site specific and designed for MOCA in LA. And MOMA at the time didn't have a surveillance thing. So it made me think about this kind of portability and how do I, how can I make something? So the idea of the crate, I wanted to take it further and this, uh, like the carnival. But as you see there on the floor, I think I was still dependent on the outlet and the electricity of the museum. So I knew that this piece was not quite resolved yet. In the front, uh, you see this two-way mirror again, and for a while, uh, when the lights are on, you see your own reflection when the lights go off. You looked at inside and you see how the whole 
piece operates in terms of the cables and the cameras and the whole mechanism inside. Then after that, I go, okay, I need to resolve this piece. So I found the piece had to work if I had a collector to, to buy the piece before I made it. And, and so how, and so that it would made, between me and a conversation with a collector, I would make like a home entertainment system, a, a thing that could be closed. And then finally I go, well, I don't want to make a crate for the work. So the crate now can, you can close it and ship it. And so this is the first of the three, how I resolved David and Goliath. This comes with, uh, it's kind of six feet by six feet. Uh, for me, it's more like a kind of kneeling piece. In the back, it comes with, uh, back then, a, a, a case of empty uh, VHS cassettes. So you would have the, the ability to record if you wanted to, and a camera, closed circuit camera. The second crate, this one, which is my favorite for me, is more like the bed, and it's narcissistic, voyeuristic, in that the two-way mirror, if you go on one side, it's a reflection. If you go on the other one, you can see through it. Again, it can close, lock it, and ship it. And the third one was this one, which is, is hinged on all sides. Uh, and it was really inspired by Gauguin's Yellow Christ. And so you can make all kinds of, it's like a furniture, and it functions. And it was beginning to, for me to think that way about these pieces. Sculpture, furniture, performative. And that's how they were, sort of, all three of them. Uh, around the, this time in the 80s, there was also this thing with art clubs and club art. Uh, many places like area in San Francisco, Club 9. And I was a little bit part of this. And uh, they asked me to do this piece at a club. And um, this is the dance floor. And what I did is I installed this flagpole with a monitor on top, and you see this image, and the image that you see on top of the dance floor is me. I had installed the similar flagpole on the roof of the club, and I sat there on the flagpole all night long. And I think it's been how ever since I came with, I'm, I'm more like I'm, I'm inside, I'm part of, of this culture, and then at the same time, I'm always kind of like outside of it at the same time. And I think it was, for me, this piece, perhaps in a very simple way, talks about that the best. And I'm incredibly afraid of heights. So I was, it was a very difficult one to do for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm stupid probably too. While they're having fun downstairs, I'm up there sitting all night. <laughs> this is um, a safe uh, window and it's, uh, mirror, that wall is freestanding. It's not part of the gallery. It's a freestanding wood panel wall, and it has a camera outside, so it's kind of an electronic window of the streets that is inside the gallery, still in the 80s. And then uh, at MOCA, part of that piece that I did, David and Goliath, with a surveillance system, in the upstairs gallery, I had the, this is the first time that I did big piece. Uh, a work that has followed me for like 30 years. And uh, this is the first uh, uh, version of Big Piece. It's about uh, f roughly 14, 15 feet tall in diameter. And it has that camera pointing at that tension where the peace sign is pushing that theatrical Johnny Carson kind of curtain. Uh, around the same time, I was doing this. This is a functional tent. She's 18 feet long, and there was a lot of, you know, homeless and all those kinds of issues. And uh, these are thrift store paintings that I took to a company that made this functional tent for me. It comes with mats and uh, uh, cooking, and it's all set up very functional. It's a very small piece called tank top around the same time. In, and inside what you see is a, a stripper, a bar, dancer, exotic dancer, and um, she is taking a couple of steps. A guy comes to grab at her and she kicks him. So with, in the silhouette of the tank, so I think it was a lot of things, you know, imperialism. A lot of things look good, but you should just leave them alone. Uh, this is the reference that I made earlier of Eve's Klein, and I think to make my 
point a little further. This is a two-part photo piece that's on the left and on the right is that. It's before Photoshop. Uh, this is called Tree, Home, uh, uh, tree, uh, home, home, tree of Knowledge. And it was interesting, too, looking back on it, because there was only ABC, NBC, and CBS. And besides PBS, but nobody watched that. So here you have ABC, CBS, and NBC all in the same volume, creating this kind of babble. And the macrame well, they really became very uh, useful in terms of like hanging the monitors. And then after that, it was this really op op an opportunity with the Cap Street project to do a very large um, piece. And but the, I didn't. I wanted to go outside of the residency and the gallery space. And I asked the people of the organization to find me a space in the city downtown San Francisco, and they found this place that was about to become a, uh, a law firm. So I found it raw, it was like 20,000 square feet, and I installed 22 monitors with 22 uh, closer system cameras, surveillance cameras. Uh, this one, which I think I have a detail of, is a camera that is pointing out to the building across the street and that was pointing at this man working in an office across the street. Of course, he didn't know that he was in my installation. And there's the camera as it's looking through into the other building. Uh, we jump, so now it's about 89, 90, uh, when the, <clears throat> uh, the Gulf War and um, uh, there's something that I, it, it's too long to explain, but coming from Cuba, very superstition and the African religion, there's this thing called promesa, and it's like a vow I learned from Seoul today. And um, basically, I, I made this kind of commitment to not use the toilet until the war was over. It was my personal protest. I'm not the type to go out in the streets and protest. Uh, so. Uh, Thank God the war only lasted for three months. So, um, but this is my shed on eight by 10 canvases. And I remember really quick anecdote, my, uh, my dealer at the time coming into my studio and I think the piece was at the end, back of the wall with bright lights. And first I go, oh, you're painting again, beautiful. And it was just like this beautiful monochrome. And it was a little fresh, and the closer they got, they started smelling the shit, and they just refused to show this work. And I thought the piece was very successful because I think I was really thinking a lot about this, you know, the external and the internal. And uh, when they didn't know it was shit, it was beautiful. Once they knew what, that it was shit, they didn't want to show it anymore, and I thought that was just really insane. Uh, then I was invited to go to uh, Canada to do a project, and <clears throat> I wanted to do a project that linked get out of the gallery again and also linked to a local cable station, and it was figured out. And so I wanted to do it in front of Hooters restaurant, and um, the audience, the art audience was invited. Just the invitation just went that the performance would happen at Hooters. And uh, so they were all in the patio back there, mingling with the local customers and the clients that go to Hooters, which goes back to the boxing and that, that sort of interest. And uh, just get rid of a little bit of the assumptions uh, and stuff, you know, without even, even being inside these places. And so it's a three camera shoot that ended up in an installation and there's a camera in the style of the Rodney King passerby that catches the action. There's another camera that knows the choreography, and then there's another camera that shows the whole trickery, the mattress and all that. I hired four professional stunt actors to choreograph this parking lot fight. But in the videos, you see that the punches are missing, you see the whole fakery of it, because I slow it down. When the fight happened, it was real and it cut, that was the intention of it.
So from that older end, the mattress was not seen. And so, like I said, it followed me. Then the city, the Arts Commission in San Francisco wanted me to, to celebrate. Another thing that I'm saying is that this piece, um, it was, there's the anniversary of the Summer of Love, which in the 80s, when I did the first one, was, of course, ridiculous because the peace sign had become kitsch and a knick-knack and a keychain that you could buy it in the hate street, you know? And so it was really not cool, actually pretty weird to do a peace sign in the 80s in the middle of Reaganomics and, uh, you know, all the, yeah. And um, it's funny how this symbol, which you'll see some other works that are my interest in signage and membership and symbols, and then the symbols that I see like as, as the potential for sculpture, also others that I see more two-dimensional. Um, this was going to be the permanent installation in Golden Gate Park. This is an architect's rendering of it, and um, it was never made. And uh, it caused incredible uh, fury all around the city, the, the neighborhood association, the Haight Street, Haight Ashbury uh, killed it, the project. Gentrification was coming heavy at the time, and they were really concerned that this peace sign would bring activism, uh, a protest point of meeting, drugs, and everyone kept telling me in these art commission meetings that I didn't make it anyway, I didn't design this damn peace sign, this is not art, and it was just a knickknack, it was stupid. And so they killed it. The best headline that I had was from the New York Times, and it said, San Francisco does not give peace a chance. That was really, uh, that's it. Like with the boxing, I think that piece functioned the best in the media. And the letters that I got, the letters to the editors, the attacks on me, like, oh, and then the suggestions were even better. Why don't you make it out of wood? Why don't you make it more hippie-like? You know, I was just like, what I wanted to do, I wanted to make it out of stainless steel on his rivets because I wanted to give it a rebranding. And I thought that the peace sign should be like have the kind of power as the military. So I wanted it to look like the airplane wings, riveted and all that. And that's what I got. The size also scared them. Anyway, so then Yerba Buena, uh, were, this is very, very controversial with national attention in the news. And uh, so they asked me to, do, to, do, to respond to the whole controversy. So I did this, then I do it again, but this is a false front like the Hollywood sets. You can see some of the armature in the back. And when you go to the back, it's plastered with all the, the press and the letters and everything. Uh, this is a still, just to give you a sense of things. Um, I became a father, that's my daughter. And uh, so I was going a lot to Waterworld and Hollywood Studios and Disneyland <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And it was really affecting my work, so I had to turn it around and go, well, you know, I'm gonna turn wherever I go with my daughter into my studio and see what, I, what kind of work I can make. So I got access in the Universal Studios in Florida to work in all the Alfred Hitchcock sets that they had made up. So this is from, I forget the movie, the Statue of Liberty scene. Uh, so yeah, they gave me access to it. So it's, they're all these videos that are in loops and um, for me, it was really this piece. And then you see on the left a little bit that I, you can see the, the set, the fakery of it. And uh, yeah, my daughter on the Statue of Liberty, there were things there. So that's that. In 99, I started reconnecting myself with Cuba again. So after a 17 year absence, I had gone in 1983 and uh, it didn't feel right with, uh, with the Soviet we, we call them the Russians. The Russians were there. I didn't even recognize my culture. Uh, so I go back in 99 because I became interested in the art that was coming out of Cuba again and uh, what was happening with a, a kind of more common language and using tools like video and performance. So that really attracted me to go back and reconnect. I didn't know anybody. I was totally disconnected from Cuba. Little by little, I started doing projects there, which I'm not showing many of them today. And little by little, I started staying at the Riviera Hotel, the Meyer Lansky last hotel the, that the revolution took over. Uh, so in Cuba, I am, they call me contaminated. 
and it's really interesting. And, and so when I go back, I am, I am Cuban, but I, I'm also perceived as a foreigner. And I'm also perceived as a tourist because I stay in these hotels that the Cubans cannot go in. You know, I can't, I mean, I have a professor in the lobby and the professor cannot go up to my room. So this is a very interesting thing. But little by little, I started doing projects. This is one, you know, there's a lot of issues with the individual and the collective in Cuba. And uh, this is a rocking chair that I designed that I had made by a rocking chair, the, the factory in Havana that makes the, these are very iconic in Cuba, the rocking chair in the porch. And, but they're always, of course, for one. So this idea of making one for three. So when one is on it, it's pretty good. You have control as an individual. When two get on it, I think you can negotiate the swinging and the speed and the rhythm. When there's three, it gets a little complicated. Uh, this is a, a piece uh, I did in the museum, I forget where. And um, it's uh, three photo albums that I found in a dumpster. And I fell in love with them. And I just, this just amazing photo albums. And basically the piece is instructs the people that if they recognize, it's a fantasy, but if they recognize this people, this family, this, to please get in touch with me because I want to get in touch with them. And they're amazing, amazing photographs, intact, three full albums. Um, this is, um, I'm getting into more, I think, current things. This is a, 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 a Weber barbecue grill, it's called Leisure. Uh, and uh, simply, I just extended the legs six feet. So it's kind of unreachable. And it is also a model. It is an architectural model for a monument for tailgating, uh, a little bit of Americana. And so I'm proposing it to a few different stadiums. And it will be a bar and restaurant next to a stadium. And I'm working with an architect in, uh, in Sweden that is making these plans for me. And she didn't know what a football stadium looked like, so she made up that whole little town there. She goes, I don't know what they look like. So, <laughs> so yeah, this would be, you know, I'm staying in the Holiday Inn Express. And then when I come into these towns, I see this water tank, and I go, that's it. That's it. That's the Weber right there. That, that scale, that size, and if you can imagine that. And then if it can rotate like the GM building, which doesn't work anymore, even better. Uh, this is a project that I was doing about proximity. So uh, I just went around wax museums taking pictures of me next to people that I wanted to be next to. So this is in the New York Wax Museum. Uh, this is a, a kind of like the analog digital shift. These are uh, contact sheets from the from very early work in the 70s. And I don't know what those things are called, loops. So the, the ladder is there that you can move around, climb it, and just look at them. So of course, you know, with contact sheets, now we just in a digital camera delete, you know? But with contact sheets, we would pick the good ones and the other ones not print. So in this piece, you really can look at all the bad, the good, and the ugly, you know, and the vulnerable. And along the same lines, uh, this is, uh, this is a, again a model, an architectural model for like would be like an apartment building and it's made of all my three quarter inch videotapes from the 70s. So these are all the outtakes from all the videos that I've made. And to me, so inside each tape, if you were to buy it and cut the, the steel straps and you had a three quarter inch machine, you could see uh, all these outtakes, they're all filled with, with actual people and all that. So they each represent like a, a kind of apartment, if you will, and like a time capsule as well. And again, very vulnerable because I was a real mean, sadistic director, and I was really mean to my people that I worked with, so it's all in there. Uh, we jump, and this is... Um, uh, it's re recent work, 2005, 2006, and um, I got 
this device. I designed this device that has this uh, fake plants with surveillance cameras in them, four of them, and I got me a closed circuit system that was able to uh, capture, save over 300 hours of footage. There's the system, there's four cameras, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. There's the cameras, and then I could wheel it out and put it out my window, and from the outside it looked like nice planters. And I started documenting daily from morning until night the activities of the day laborers across the street from my studio. And the piece is called uh, day la uh, mapping, day labor mapping the outside, Fat Chance Bruce Nauman. And it's a reference to Bruce Nauman's piece with the mice at night. And the same thing, I was very inspired by thy work. Here you see it. And it had a lot to do with the, uh, you know, I mean, I'm waiting in my studio, right? We, the activity in the studio, waiting. Uh, ideas and so forth, and how they were waiting for work. So this thing, well, well, one aspect of it, another aspect of it was basically was flipping the whole thing, night, day. Uh, but um, also the, what Bruce Nauman talked about, how much you see when you think there's nothing going on. And the, as days progressed and the more I watched, the more it was just more, the stillness became, became very poetic. and. Uh, I started noticing, besides the, the fixed surveillance cameras, I had my own camera that I could then, if we think of in an anthropological way, you know, this gave me the license to zoom in, zoom out, and choose and frame, which to some many people have been a little controversial because uh, the, you know, it's been questioned. Uh, so I started noticing the little drug deals happening the ones that were very official with their painter's outfit. There's the cameras. The, 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 the way that the garbage can became furniture, uh, the way they used the walls to play, to play sometimes, they played cards. So I started really looking, the ones that wear the white pants, painter uniform, they seemed to be more serious, more you know, focused in getting their job. Others seem to be more like on the top left, hanging out. So it was just really an amazing thing. It went on for three months, and uh, I've shown it in different versions, but this is in the uh, Orange County Museum. Uh, and then after that, I was invited to do this exhibition in a, a gallery in San Francisco, and what I had noticing was that it was just a hipster scene and they were just all about openings. So I went, well, you know, why don't we just have a never-ending opening? And so I, I changed the hours of the gallery to Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from seven until midnight. And I designed the furniture in this, I turned it into a, a bar, a social space. And uh, the wallpaper comes from all the bulk that you get on the computer, you know, like make your penis bigger and all that kind of stuff. And then it, it ran for three months. I mean, it was so successful as a business for the gallery that they, it was supposed to be one month and they extended it for three months. And I became bartender, bouncer, everything, and navigating, kicking people out when they got too drunk, entertaining them at the bar. I love the busy nights as much as I love the empty nights that Sunday night, just a couple of neighbors would go by and go, this is a new business, what is this? And uh, I also had uh, uh, artists at DJ come and do evenings. I had ar invited artists to come and, and cook. That is Howard Freed, actually, my teacher that I went to the San Francisco Art Institute on the left. And that is David Ireland, the very amazing artist on the right, who just passed away. And that was the, the windows were sealed and it's called social space bulk. I had a talent night. You know, the gong show has never left me. It's just that from participant, I, have, I think I've become Chuck Berry in many ways. I like to watch uh, and giving people this sort of opportunity to express themselves. And then I had uh, gaming nights. I had dominoes, poker nights. I even had a 
selected porno screening night. It, uh, you get the drift. It was very and exhausting because, uh, like I said, it became a job for me every weekend. And I think that was part of the performance. I started getting better and better at, you know, working the room, spending only a couple of minutes with someone, going on the other one. The punk kids that were, you know, tagging the back room, how do you kick them out? All of that became it was I really sort of enjoy the most. And the bar only sold rum and Tecate beers. Beer and rum. Uh, then uh, go back. Uh, it, it's almost like every ten years, you know. Uh, so uh, this was an artist. Her, this is how I show the piece with the video and the prop. But it was this artist, Chelsea Torres, very young artist, really incredible. And she approached me. She's the one that approached me and asked me. She goes, I have this idea. I would like to roll a peace sign around the city and Golden Gate Park for a week from nine to five. I went, cool. I said, only if, you know, so then I, I wanted to design the prop, the peace sign to her body specifications. And uh, she did that so every day. And when she would get to the Golden Gate Park where the piece was going to be originally, she would put on high heels and go from nine to five around and around the panhandle. And little by little, eventually, the neighbors started coming out and engaging with her and why she was doing that. I, I, I wanted to show this slide because I think sometimes it's something to just to share with you and things that, you know, are really ironic and interesting. So this is in Havana and the building in case you don't know, I just wanted to share with you, is the U.S. interest section. Because, because of the embargo and no diplomatic relations, uh, the, Cuban inter the U.S. interest section is inside this building that is totally, you can't even walk by the sidewalk. It's unaccessible. But uh, around 2008, yeah, it was, I love it because it's like, uh, who has the lightning field? Walter De Maria meets Jenny Holzer. But these are the two governments doing this work, you know? So the United States did this Jenny Holzer ticker on the building, throwing propaganda to the Cubans. And so Fidel and the government responded by putting these 200 damn ass flagpoles with flag po fla black flags right in front of it to block it. And it was just really amazing for me when I saw that when Obama won the ticker went away, so Fidel took the flags away, but now the poles are still there. So it really is like a lightning field, a dead monument, it was really beautiful. Uh, so this is 2008, and uh, a project that involved um, uh, at the Museum of Modern Art, an audition similar to American Idol, or the Gong Show, in which people were given a minute to go on stage and fill in, fill in the I want you. I want you to brush your teeth, be good, whatever. So can we show a little bit of that video? I'm, I'm over time already. <laughs> okay, so just a couple of minutes of this because I, I, I hope you like it. I really love this project. You know what I mean? Like, this is the standard view. Yeah, you have a lot of ones on this picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no judgment. I'm trying to be, I have no judgment. I'm just gonna be honest. I do have one. Uh, right before the elections in 2008, yeah, Obama. I don't know, I just walked in here. I'm not. <laughs> 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 <Okay. laughs> <laughs> I want you to
to make a difference to yourself and to the world. Listen to the wind. It whispers before it roars. You are in the center of the eye of all that is. It is your thoughts that form the world around you. It is your dreams that condition the future. Chaos springs from the void and form orders the chaos. You have the power to move that energy in either direction. Something significant is happening Listen to the wind and begin to make a difference. I want you to eat your vegetables. That's it. you to experience silence, S-I-L-E-N-C-E. -E. I want you to speak to me authentically from your heart. I want you to be willing to be vulnerable. I want you to resist the urge to resort to judgment and labeling, shame and blame. I want you to truly listen when I speak and to value my needs as much as you do your own. I want you to help me build trust and connection in this world by practicing this form of authentic communication. This is nothing short of an invitation to live peace now. I want you to know the astonishing light of your being. I want you to recognize that every thought, every action, and every living thing is sacred. And I want you to discover and do what makes you come alive inside. Do I start? Mm -hmm. okay. I want you to pass a proposition that would amend the state constitution of California to institute a set of mandated practices designed to enforce the responsible usage of objects. And this would mean that everybody would either fabricate everything themselves or know exactly where they come from. In the case of fabricating your own objects, you would receive a tax credit. In the case of knowing where things come from, this includes knowing what material it's made from, knowing the history of the material, knowing the source of the material, knowing the history of the object's use, knowing the history of the manufacturing entity, knowing the history of the manufacturer itself and the location of the manufacturer, and of course, the biography of the inventor of the object. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, she was great anyway. <laughs> um, so then, there was another tape. Then they came back. The, about a hundred people showed up. Then they, we, the judges selected 33 of them. And then they came back the week after that to deliver their thing in front of the public. So the the theater of the museum was pretty packed. We had Veronica 
Veronica Claus, a beautiful jazz singer. We had an MC. It was very, and then the, the, the audience picked the winners. Five winners were picked. And the winners got their own poster plastered all over the city. There you see. And these are the winners. My favorite. And then, ironically, finally, the, the Oakland Museum, not San Francisco. Oakland commissions me to do a peace sign, which is now at the Oakland Museum across from the courthouse. So we finally found a home that's, to me, very California. <laughs> oh, now I'm going to go really quick. I'm sorry that I'm going over time. Uh, just going to go quick. I think you have enough references, and then you can, uh, yeah. So I always was fascinated by Batman and Robin walking the walls. I never had a TV in Cuba, and when I came in the 60s, I spent hours and hours and hours watching reruns because I wanted to, like, catch up. And uh, so then I did my own walk the wall piece. You can see there that it was connected to the Internet. You could watch it live. And I invited a local designer, very urban punk designer. He's only 18 years old uh, to do like uh, a fashion show using the wall. And then after that, during the exhibition, people could walk the wall. And but he, I, was, I was using the downtown San Francisco buildings. See, it's just really the camera vertical. And then Fria Bawena invited me to be part of uh, their, their exhibition, and I started doing these pieces, like with the shit in the window, things come back, the dog shit. And so a lot of issues going on with dispensary, with recreational versus medicine, marijuana. I am a patient myself. Patient, that sounds so good. Patient. <laughs> I, am, I have a doctor. <laughs> um, so a lot of, there were a lot of issues, and uh, I also wanted to design a piece that, you, that the museum could be close, and, you, and I can still have my work. So I picked the window. I didn't want to be inside, uh, be outside. There's another shot. At night, it was just really beautiful with those very intense wattage in that green marijuana leaf that was just this green glow. A lot of tourists thought that I had, I had turned the museum into a dispensary. And part of this project, I also set up a series of panels and, and, and invited guests like from the, uh, from the a federal agent to a doctor dispensary. We even, I arranged tours of dispensary for those that were curious about what they looked like inside. And it was part of that project. Right after that project, I did this. I was invited by the Performance Art Institute and upstairs, the first floor is the Performance Art Institute. The rest of the building is a software company with all the tech issues that are going on in San Francisco right now. So I decided to do, I hire a design painter and did to do this quote by Scott McNeil from 1999, which basically said, he said, you have zero privacy anyway, get over it. And uh, at the time, in 99, when he said it, it was in, in kind of like, this is before NASA and Snowden and all that stuff. And it was basically, he was very, he was against people having access to the surveillance that is being done to us. So then I thought that my piece, again, the show was inside, I wanted to use the window. I thought that I was actually, they were doing a surveillance show, and in a way, I wanted to address the show saying, Get over it, <laughs> surveillance show, I don't know what that's going to do. And then on the other hand, it, it, this company that was in the rest of the building. Well, the piece lasted, after the sign painter finished it, it lasted three hours. Because the software company guys came down and threatened the landlord of the building 
do with so much that eventually they even evicted the Performance Art Institute out of there. And they came down and uh, had to come down. Uh, to this day, I wanted to engage with those guys because I really wanted to see. Uh, but the, the gallery, I was a little disappointed with the gallery director. I didn't, didn't fight it. And it, inevitably, he ended up being evicted. <laughs> so it would have been a fun fight. Um, and I didn't know if it was the, that I t the sign, the look, the aesthetics, I turned it into like a cheap furniture store or a used car dealership. <laughs> I don't know if they had a problem with the aesthetics of the sign or if they had a problem with the quote. So I just really wanted to like find that out, but I never got the chance to it. Really quick, I started really looking at American Idol, uh, political stages, you name it, and very much interested in stages and creating these drawings that, with the hope that someday they will be made. Uh, stripper clubs, all of that I started looking at. So these are some drawings really quick. This is my favorite, which is a combination of a stripper pole and a fireman's pole. And I wanted to, I wanna make them when the opportunity comes. Uh, this is part of the project I'm doing with my mother that I told you, and this is using her patterns for me to figure out how to make a dress, and I made this, I designed this dress, I hired a, a seamstress to put it together for me, and then I had my daughter model it. It's, it's a huge project. This is a, a light box. And this is a, a pool t uh, for the Havana Biennale. I wanted to address the reforms going on in Cuba right now and the anxieties going on and the speculations. So I, this is a piece that I had made in Havana by an amazing craftsman. Uh, so I designed the pool table, it was fabricated, and it's in the shape of Cuba. And it's called uh, Irregular Encounters Le uh, Leveling the Field. So no matter addressing those reforms, no matter how good you are, you really have to relearn the game and learn how to play the same game from different angles. Uh, it also involved uh, bleachers and a bar that I'll show you. And the wall, instead of the blackboard that people take turns, uh, it was the whole wall. Uh, the pool tables uh, disappeared from Cuba right after the revolution because it was a city male gambling space. But then they came back recently for the tourists, just like golf courses have come back. And so there's a lot of these kids have only seen pool tables in movies. And it was a very public space. And you can see how they're taking turns and participating and started accumulating on the wall. And the, during the Havana Biennale, that's a, that's a art Havana Biennale crowd, but this is what I was interested in getting. And we have a, two, a monetary system of pesos and euros. The tourists have one currency, the Cubans have another, but the Cuban government um, liked my project, officiated it, and so the bartender, the bar, ha accepted both currencies so that the Cuban people could come and participate in my work. And it was equipped, you can see everything, cigarettes. It even had the drink of the enemy, whiskey. Yeah, and because you know, even if you were good, you, you know, everyone just could play it and engage with it. There you can see the composition up there with the bleachers, the table, and the bar. Even if they didn't play, they loved putting their names on the wall. Uh, I'm getting there, I'm almost done. Uh, this is in Brooklyn, uh, I think it was continuing kind of with bulk, and this is a, a digital wallpaper print, it's 12 feet by eight feet, but the actual object is about half an inch, and the ball is made out of my pubic hair. And a dead fly. I sort of like, like, you know, like Obama trying the podium. I like catching flies. And uh, then it was a functioning water fountain that goes out into the back space where there was a drain. And in the back, I again designed a bar. 
And I hired, I, a, a, a casting call went out for a hipster or someone to play the part of a hipster or a hipster. I didn't care, just I needed a hipster. And his instructions were to sit there, stand there by the bar in his world, in his headphones with his own playlist and bring any kind of magazines and laptop, whatever. Like in other words, just be there and do your thing and ignore everybody else. And once in a while, he would, he, we, uh, we, we connected his playlist to the, to the front space. And uh, whenever, whenever he like went over to have a drink, uh, he, he, whatever he was listening to switched to it. So it became the, the music would come on and it was very theatrical and he would go there, drink the water and go back and it, the music would stop again. And again, similar things happen after the opening. I let the owners of the gallery curate and do whatever they wanted. I just sort of wanted to create a container. So there were like video screenings, there were games, there were performance art by the local community, which I didn't know any. There were all kinds of activities going on for a month. Then I did a, another casting call in San Francisco for young professionals. And that's that, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to show the tape. Um, people will go up to the X, drink water, and leave. And uh, so in the video, the video is a split screen with a close-up of the water as the bubbles come out. And on the right hand of the, of the split screen is the person that drinks and leaves. So it has this sort of like structure as well. Uh, you know, really quick, uh, Andy Warhol's only videotape was a shot of a water cooler while you hear the talk in the factory close up. Yoko Ono did a show about water and Andy sent that tape to Yoko Ono. And so there's like a reference to that historical piece there. But using the water cooler and the young professionals in this particular neighborhood, when you go to, uh, I went to a bar recently and they, uh, Literally uh, kicked me out of the bar because I guess, you know, they thought that I was uh, uh, part of the tech company. I was invading the neighborhood. And I go, dude, I've lived here for 40 years. <laughs> so it's a very intense kind of gentrification going on in this neighborhood. So it was really interesting to get a casting call. I didn't think I was going go to get any, but actually a lot of young professionals showed up. There's the, you can, oh, there you can see it. How then the installation. And then now I'm on my way to uh, next in June to uh, Denver. I really got the uh, nice opportunity to uh, work at the oldest, uh, one of the oldest church in Denver. Where, and then uh, I'm going to do f the first of those stages, platforms, catwalks there, which is, you can see the drawing of the, is based on the nave in uh, church architecture. And there's going to be all kinds of also activities and things going on there. And, uh, and that is uh, a billboard that, uh, from a photograph that came in the front page of the Chronicle in San Francisco. And that's my daughter. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I know it's late and